Tällöin tää.
do this with an axe. Interesting. But according to the new laws, you're meant to, uh, there's some things that you're meant to make them unconscious before you actually do them. Because it's this research that just uh, <laughs> also the stress and then yeah. Um, yeah. the decapitation itself. Uh, there's actually, I think it's seven seconds after that, and the, the animal still feels the pain. So the, the death is really, really painful, even though it's crazy. So it's considered to be more more ethical that you first put them in the head so they instantly lose consciousness, they don't feel anything anymore, and then you chop them in the head. Which one do you know? I told you about her? No, the one that you have. This is from a friend of mine. I went to well, his daughter. I went to. I studied in the UK with him. He's half French, half UK. They live in, in France. And then their firstborn daughter, Mila, they named. They gave him her second name. It he wanted to name. Uh, we were really good friends with Georges in, in when we studied. Um, and then he always thought that I had a beautiful name, so when their daughter was born, he was right to me. We're going to name her Leela Paulina. And then she's been following, I've never met her. She's about like six or seven years old. She's been following my Insta, and of course, it's like nothing but horses there. So she wanted to write me a letter, and she wrote, there's another drawing of her. Look at the first. I think these are even more. They're really cool, like with the head. So she wrote me that she just started course writing and that she has even
Okay, bad lecture. Oh, yeah, that, that's... Ja sitten se on suomalainen 
I didn't have to be the first to be the first to be the first to be the first to be the Ladies and gentlemen, and all the other beings that join us here today in their own ways. 
The text and the body that generates it cannot be separated. These are words of Thomas Prime, whose writings was one of the first places where I met author ethnography as an approach to doing and writing research. This approach takes this statement very seriously, making the researcher's own lived experiences an object of the research. As such, of ethnography begins always in the concrete body, time, and space. It begins in those moments when something captures us and makes us speechless. In those events after which life does not look quite the same. And it keeps beginning every day in many mundane here and nows that come to matter only later on as a result of reflexivity. Perhaps that is why ethnography is understood by many scholars not only as a research approach, but also as a way of life, a way of being in the world, being with others and being for others, often as a response to the wrongs of the world. The here and now of me composing these words is a year since my dad passed away. Three months that he spent in the hospital bed in a state between consciousness and unconsciousness gave me a chance to prepare for the possibility <coughs> of him never coming back to us. Nothing could have prepared me, however, for the flood of words I and my family heard at the two-day vigil and the funeral, tributes by several generations of people whose lives he touched, sometimes even saved, as a cycling coach. It was as if I met my dad anew. A little boy came to my mom, saying with a shaky voice, the time of training with the coach were the most beautiful years of my life. The boy's mom standing behind him told us later that he had been struggling to gather the courage to share this one sentence for the past few days. This was just a few months before this full version of the doctoral dissertation was to be finished. It was the time when letting this dissertation story go off into the world was becoming more and more real and more and more scary. The courage of all the boys and girls who shared big and small stories of their encounters with my dad was much needed reminder of something that I already knew quite well, but that can be easily forgotten in the fast, future-oriented modern world we live in. That moment was a visceral reminder that stopping to share the powerful stories that affect us and change our ways of being in the world is our duty. It's a duty because these stories have the potential to change the world we inhabit. They have the potential to produce personal and social cultural hope and we should not keep them to ourselves, even if it means becoming vulnerable and uncomfortable. Even if, or perhaps especially, if it makes listeners readers vulnerable and uncomfortable. That is okay. Because sharing stories is also a sign of care. It's sharing time, energy, and attention. It's nourishing, like sharing the mushrooms you collect or the tomatoes you grow. It's nourishing like autumn time, the time of harvest and the time of preserving and sharing in preparation for a long winter. It's nourishing, although it's also the time of decay and dying, the indispensable parts of life. The autumn time of our modern social institutions, however, such as university, is different. Autumn here is the time of new beginnings and actions. As the institutions emerge from the suspension of summer, calendars fill up with new deadlines and commitments, new old courses, meetings, projects, Another round of research funding application. Teachers meet new students, new old hopes and fears, new old challenges and joys of teaching. New roles to be taken, like the one I'm taking right now. The here and now of me saying these words marks the end of a somewhat linear process of getting a doctorate. The moment of sharing the research finding, ho findings, hoping they make a contribution, hoping they may be useful for the world. Yes, I am releasing this dissertation as a research product, but not so much as a text that tells what I found out. It's rather a text that does, or aims to do. It's a gesture, small gesture, 
in response to an event or events that once made me stop and think about teaching, learning, researching, knowing, being, relating. It's a response to events that made me speechless and came to matter. It's a response and account of these events, which I also call strange dialogues. Strange because they cannot be always understood, interpreted, analytically explained, or theorized, and they don't have to be. They are dialogues and counters that cannot be planned or controlled, dialogues that do not necessarily aim at mutual understanding or some form of consensus. And I'm also releasing this dissertation as an invitation to such a dialogue and counter. I invite you to enter the worlds I travel through and co-created in this dissertation, asking you to let go of the need for immediate meaning making and conclusions, asking you to slow down and listen, not only with ears or eyes, but with the whole body, mind, heart and soul. I invite you to travel through the ocean of seemingly unrelated, free-flowing fragments of the story, carried by the waves of Jewish mysticism of Martin Buber, the colonial post-socialist thinking of Walter Mignola and Magna Costa Nova, Western Enlightenment, Zen Buddhist Buddha, Japanese Shintoist Ma, nature, dreams, memories, and I invite you to travel through that ocean and let those fragments gently shape you, possibly producing stories of your own, multiple new stories that pluralize the world rather than universalize it, stories that help us become attuned to many worlds that make up this universe rather than desperately trying to understand them. This dissertation began reluctantly. It was reluctant because it was afraid of becoming another paper, a commodity, one more academic publication among millions of others published every year. Yet it had to be written. It came out of an organic need, the need to make sense of my experiences of being teacher, student, researcher in an international higher education. The need to stop and think about what I'm doing, why I'm doing it, and whether what I'm doing is really what the world needs. I entered the Finnish University as an international master's student, continued to our doctoral studies, and meanwhile became a teacher in a broadly understood field of global education. The questions of identity and my role in academia related to broader questions over the critical role of higher education in a power knowledge network have become important in my work. My experiences as a teacher working with students from various social, cultural, geopolitical and epistemic backgrounds have led me to consider more deeply and critically the complexities of the ethical responsibilities that go hand in hand with the power that anyone committed to education has. I felt it was ethically problematic and pedagogically undesirable to call a colleague, Maya Lanas, to leave myself out of that reflexive learning and unlearning process that we ask students to engage in. Especially since several years earlier as a student myself, I felt I was not sufficiently challenged in that regard, something that I came to realize only later on. I felt it was for me, time to go beyond talking about dilemmas of social and epistemic injustices. It was for me time to stop talking about being and knowing differently and begin living it without waiting to find out first how to do it. Even if, or perhaps especially, if it was to make me feel clumsy, stupid, nervous and vulnerable. So this research began as a self-study of my life as a teacher at the university, but it became a transformational journey, full of unexpected turns and messy, just like life. As I allowed myself to be taken and surprised by the process of writing as inquiry, writing was a way, of, a way to know and explore, not just to communicate in a neatly structured and organized text what I knew, and I was also writing to know how I can write, how I can know, and what knowing really means. In other words, I was writing not only to contemplate my actions and their meanings, but also to contemplate how I'm contemplating and why I'm contemplating the way I do. Somewhere in that journey, I found that language in the ways it's usually used in academia was not enough. 
at times simply inadequate, and at times even paralyzing and constraining, almost oppressive. That is why this work took the shape it did. Weaving prose, poems, dance videos, images, fictionalized stories, dreams, and Another consequence of this writing as an inquiry process is the circular or rather spiral structure of the dissertation. It emerged organically as a structure that I felt could more adequately carry the nature of the process. The main part of the dissertation is built around the four seasons of the year in Finland. Each season or chapter has its own, or own role and focus, but none can exist without the others. The reader can begin the journey at any season chapter and follow the cycle. The chapters take readers to my classes, meetings with students, dance workshops are participated in, conference rooms, my old home city in Poland, to the places of my childhood, and even to a medical surgery. They take readers to the unknown, perhaps strange places, and ask them to find their way, their own way out. I do offer a map to help the readers navigate, see the possible entry points, guide them through space and time. But I also ask the reader to keep in mind that as with any map, it erases the wilderness of reality and limits the possibilities of imagining the variety of paths that can be taken. So if you choose to enter the story in summer, you'll begin with my experiences as a researcher, looking for her place in the modern academia. In summer, I take you through the corridors and rooms of higher education institutions to think how we make and are made of these spaces in terms of the politics of knowledge production, to think and sense how, at the moment, we step into the institution, the institution steps into us. I take you to a conference room in Iraskula to talk about author ethnography as a decolonial gesture that opens up a possibility to interrogate our colonial complicities as well as a possibility to shift the ground narratives we live by. And I also take you to another conference in my hometown, Poland, where I was unwittingly positioned as one of the experts on the Finnish education. Writing about that moment through a decolonial lens triggered the need to look at my experiences as an immigrant researcher born and brought up in a post-socialist space in times of political transformations marked by the end of the Cold War and now working in Finland. It also set into motion a totally unanticipated journey into the personal past intertwined with the historical past of my hometown. Then if you choose to enter the story in autumn, you will meet me through the experiences of reclaiming my artistic sensitivities. Zooming in on a particular moment just before the academic year starts, after the summer break, a couple of weeks after I came back from a Bhutto dance camp, I highlight the tension of my disembodied experiences as a member of an academic institution and embodied experiences of a dancer. The chapter is a journey of staying within that tension, finding ways of writing that would reintegrate my body, mind, spirit, giving them all an equal voice. It's a journey towards turning the anxieties of being uncertain and of being constantly in question into a legitimate inquiry driving force. Call this chapter a methodological one, if you like. Although, who needs a methodological chapter? Winter takes you to my experiences as a university teacher. It takes you to three moments of my educational practice, praxis where I keep asking what teaching, learning, and education is for me. How the structures and underlying epistemologies of a modern institution make me to the teacher that I am, and how they enable or constrain the possibilities of being a teacher I could be. Winter stories are a journey of reclaiming that state of not knowing as a force driving for learning, teaching, and founders. And in spring, I become a learner, as you will meet me through the greatest teacher that I have, the body. The chapter will take you to a medical surgery room to listen to the imagined conversation of my body cells, deciding they would speak out loud to remind me about their existence. I'll take you then to Puto Camp to show how this dance form offered me ways to learn to listen and respond to my body's desperate call. I will show how dancing into the unknown, undance as Puto is often called, has driven this inquiry of writing to know, of writing through the dilemmas that it cannot be solved, 
and has taken this <coughs> poetic writing as a way of knowing. The lived experiences of my body in Buddha praxis inspire me to think about and leave education as a search for and creation of silent, slow, empty spaces where we can let go of the need to know, where we can hear our own research questions. What happens when you stop to listen to your body, to others' body, to the beat of your heart, to the shimmer of your breath, to sand, to water, to gravity, to birches, to a butterfly caught in your office over and over again, and the dead swallows in a dance studio, to the silence of your students, to the words of their poems, to their tears and smiles, to their hopes and fears, to your child's skin, to the tales of Jewish mysticism, to the ghosts of our ancestors, to the failing heart of your father, and the heads in the suits. I'm coming out of this own research with a deeper sense of many worlds that I'm made of, that I live in, and co-create every day. I come out with a deeper sense that these world, worlds can coexist and do not have to compete against each other, even if some seem to have a louder voice than others. I come out of this inquiry with a deeper understanding that if we are serious about global international higher education, contributing to the elimination of various forms of injustices, it needs to become a space where all worlds can coexist, not compete. The space into which students, teachers, and researchers alike can bring all of their worlds, be it human, non-human, spiritual, natural. What if it was a space where being silent doesn't mean you don't exist? What if it's a space where writing poetry is not a sentimental idealism, but a legitimate mode of being with the world, and where tears do not have to be secretly wiped? What if it was a space where the integrity of body, mind, spirit isn't silenced or ridiculed, or at best pushed to well-being workshops? What if it was a space where one is not ashamed to use the word spirit or soul, whatever it means to each of us? And to be sure, I'm not talking about inclusion here. I'm talking about the radical, a tender, shaking of the very foundations of the house. I'm talking about extended disobedience, to use Walter Mignolo's idea, that changes the terms of the conversation, not just the contents. I come out of this inquiry with a deeper sense that ethnographic being in education can be about all those tiny acts of epistemic disobedience and about carving out our own spaces for being, not necessarily in terms of another project, as if this was the only way a university can justify its own existence, but in terms of microscopic spaces between you and I, between I and I, between I, you, and the world in its all manifestations. An orthopographic pedagogical being can shape, shift attention to that space in between. It can help accept what we can never fully know, accept that perhaps what is more important is the process of being knowing, rather than the knowledge as an object in itself. Orthoethnography can help understand that perhaps it's not a methodological challenge that we should be, should be my, our main concern in the current moment, it's not a matter of finding better ways, better research methods, more effective strategies and policies, better tools for communication, or better solutions to the problems through collecting and generating more and more data and information. Perhaps the challenge is to resist the urgency to act upon those weak answers, as by Natura de Souza Santos calls them, and think, sense, whether the world that our actions seem to sustain is actually worth sustaining. The challenge is to begin to ask ourselves strong questions. The questions about the essence of relating and living together with the planet. Of ethnography has the potential to slow life down, which helps to hear those questions. 
of ethnographic pedagogical being may help us to see that perhaps education and research are not about producing more and more knowledge or producing answers, but rather about an adventure that puts imagination into motion. Imagination that has power to generate new alternatives for living together with the world and think alternatively about those alternatives. And that adventure itself has the potential to nurture our affective, relational, and intellectual stamina that we need in order to live and survive in this damaged, disorienting world. I believe this stamina is something we need just as much, if not more, than new technologies. I come out of this inquiry having experienced through my bones the transformative potential of ethnographic living and writing. It made me put the self back into teaching and learning and into research so that the self can be unsettled, questioned, rediscovered, remembered, and reimagined. Even more importantly, to be in mind and body that we are all tiny parts intertwined in the same global web of life. I come out of this inquiry curious to see what happens when this narrative gesture of mine, some sort of story of me in the world, begins to live its own life and write its own stories, perhaps extending the community of my body cells into slightly bigger communities of thinking, sensing, and being. But that is now completely out of my hands.
as the upper end named by the University of Rome Graduate School, I now call upon you to present your critical comments on my doctoral thesis. Thank you very much, Professor, and thank you for that really moving and powerful introduction to the work, too. Good morning, everyone. This is an epic thesis that tackles philosophy, art, teaching, decolonizing academia, auto ethnography, and aligns all this in Catherine's rich creative process where she reads, dance, life writing, and a variety of styles and genres and research together to produce an almost immersive text that demands the reader engage, reflect, and come to know the world and themselves a little differently. Her embodies and bodily response to her lived experiences as an artist, dancer, mother, academic, offers a new way of being in autoethnography and academia that is an original contribution of scientific significance, particularly in the field of education, but also well-being, arts practice, and creative writing. Magda's ambition, sense of craft, and personal insight are all to be applauded. She allows herself to be vulnerable on the page, but always with rigorous intellect and artistry underpinning her work so that it never adheres to criticisms of autoethnographic work that it is inward gazing and narcissistic. Indeed, Magda's work is in the spirit of social justice and how we can decolonize academia and come to value teaching as a craft, as an art. Her plea is passionate, absorbing, and highly persuasive, and this is because she has analyzed a huge range of academic ideas and theories and used these to inform her personal creative practice. What also impressed me is the standard of each style and genre of writing. With her poetry, script, images, prose, letters, critical writing, reflection, even the WhatsApp messages, Magda has achieved a significant level of expertise, and this is essential for how autoethnography now evolves. It is not enough to put the self on the page and believe through our research, but Magda wields techniques and has edited her work to a really impressive level. And this writing is ready for publication to get out into the world and move and transform the people as it has moved and transformed Magda, as it has moved and transformed me. You say on page 36, I hope the text can take care of you as it has been taking care of me, and I hope that this Bible is part of that care which you have extended to me through the text I now offer you through this new strange dialogue we are about to have. It is interesting that in this space we are opponents the institutional term and I'd like to adhere to the regulations and traditions that your work is seeking to challenge. Not that your thesis is ever dismissive or disrespectful to the conventions of academia, but rather you invite the reader to consider other ways of being in higher education and how we might evolve, with a particular focus on how we decolonize research and pedagogy and also how we value ourselves as teachers. What, which I absolutely agree with you on, teaching is a craft. With 40% of academics in the UK considering leading education, I would suggest that your work is timely. It is needed. It reminds us that what we do matters. It is personal and professional. You speak of love in the thesis, and I do still love academia. The increasing pressure to do more for less, the volume of administration and never-ending bureaucracy and email may impact on our motivation, but here in your writing, your story highlights the potential of education research to enact change support the well-being of staff and students and respond to global challenges around the environment, diversity and inclusion, mental health. Being a teacher is an art and nurturing our passionate commitment for it is crucial. Thank you for reminding me of this and for opening up a space for me to reflect on how I feel about academia and how my creativity can help me as our students to traverse it. On page 121, you say all technology allows us to, indeed demands that we acknowledge how we are thinking with a person experience, a moment, something that more traditional forms of academic writing do not leave space for, even if they demand to cite multiple sources. Yet, and this is what your work does, it creates space for the reader to think through and with your work that is ultimately uplifting, restorative, and with ideas for research and pedagogy. As a result, I do have questions, so many questions, because you have opened up a reflective gap in your text but I will try and restrain myself of asking all of them as your thesis actually motivated me to write 15 pages of reflection. <laughs> um, but in particular today, I would like to focus on your title, The Depiction of the Inner Critic, I Am Not an Academic, the tension between wanting to present a wild thesis without any questions question that is still presented in a tr traditional form using text, reference, expert. Your use of methodology and your particular approach, a defense 
sense of the structure of the thesis, the need for gatekeepers and the function of the thesis survivor in that process, ethical considerations, recommendations for pedagogy, your, your personal creativity and how this can motivate others, and what next for you, but also for academia. Um, but if you are ready, Magda, perhaps you would like to sit down so we can start this strange yes, start. I'm sitting, I'm just going to have a volume a little bit up because I can't find it. But I think, yeah, I think uh, we'll manage. Yes, I'm ready. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Thank you, Jessica, Great. for your opening words. A pleasure. Thank you for writing the thesis, Michael. So, my, uh, my first question is, let's start, let's start with the title. Treading gently between the worlds, also epigraphically exploring strange dialogues, in quotation marks, within the modern university. Can you tell me why, um, so can you tell me specifically why gently and why, are, and why strange? What makes these dialogues stranger than any other dialogues in academia? Yes, thank you. Uh, the title came to me actually quite early on in the process, uh, and I, for some reason I really liked it right away. <laughs> and we often uh, pain, painstakingly tried to find a title, and I was so quite surprised to stay throughout. And precisely because it um, uh, it brings up some of the main main points of the whole work. Why gently? Uh, I think it links to also the word treading uh, and the kind of idea of process and the <coughs> um, Yeah, this emphasizes the, the the process nature of the whole of the whole uh, inquiry, uh, but also the slowness. Uh, so that's why the gentleness has to be there. I think, and this. Physically, this really comes from my Buddha experiences, where walk is one of the main practices to start with. Walking for hours on the beach or in the desk, if you are just walking, trying to feel um, the ground, trying to feel whatever whatever you're walking on. For hours, you could walk for hours. And it has to be gentle to meet your body, because that's the whole idea, that through that walk, you find your body again. And if you do it uh, <laughs> not gently, uh, it's not going to work. But I think it translates into any kind of uh, action that we are taking uh, that aims to change something. So if I think about the Buddha walk as a way to bring the body back to me, or Buddha practice in general, uh, if I take that analogy into the, any kind of uh, radical Word that tries to change something, if you're not gentle, you're just gonna, <laughs> yeah, it's not gonna work. It's just gonna create more resistance. Uh, and I think gently also because uh, of the word you mentioned was in your opening statements, because of the love that we need. And uh, gently goes into tenderness. I think tenderness is a form of love as well. So yeah, I, um, that may be, um, on, on that on that aspect of the title, and then um, the dialogues, strange dialogues. It's actually um, the phrase is actually taken from Tammy's Cry. She uses the word uh, of ethnography being a way to get into those strange dialogues. Um, and uh, strange because uh, first of all, because they cannot often be put into words. So it's very difficult to write about it and talk about it to other people. And this is something I've been struggling throughout the process. And uh, strange because uh, they also make us meet ourselves uh, kind of anew. So it's not about just meeting me and the world, but also I met myself in ways that I didn't expect to meet myself. Uh, and that was, that, that was strange me, unfamiliar me in a way. Um, but, and I wanted also to, maybe also in the word of, um, yeah, so cannot be explained, cannot be put into words, cannot be controlled, cannot be planned. This is important because I think we often think about dialogue as something we can voluntarily enter and leave at any 
strong wish when we are not happy with what's happening. But the, the whole idea of the, my thing about dialogue is, is that it's not a, yeah, it can be, it can, cannot be really engineered, planned, controlled, and left at, at any time that you wish. You, we are always in a, in a dialogue. Um, I was thinking about the word encounters rather than dialogues, but I like the word dialogue because it also makes me, uh, or enables me to um, draw attention to that very often taken for granted idea of dialogue in the intercultural global education, where it's about you know, making the difference, negotiating for the difference with the aim of some sort of a, um, creating some sort of a consensus or some level of understanding. Um, and it's for problems only, mainly, and not for the meeting itself. So that's why I also kept the dialogue itself, to draw attention to the fact that I'm kind of trying to depart from that commonly accepted uh, idea of dialogue and integration. Hmm. Um, that's, a, that's a really good answer. But I suppose when I finished reading your thesis, I had to go back to the title, because I feel like you have achieved something very distinct and important with the work that you've done, but I don't feel that it's named in the title. And this feeds into my second question, which is about the, the kind of refusal to want to name aims and, and research questions and things like that as well. But I somehow feel like the title could celebrate how you've evolved your technography mm. and, and, and the potential that you've identified in your technography for um, decolonizing academia as well. Um, and, and the fact that you've you know, not to have me cry, um, and also this idea of treading gently. Um, I suppose like our more uh, power, I know power can be gentle perhaps, but, but I just wondered if now on reflection if there was any, anything that you would, especially for new readers coming to your work, would they know from that title what they might get from reading your work? Now that you said that, perhaps I could, um I could um, somehow rephrase it so that it's, it, it, like I said, actually, that's, that's, that's an interesting point. That it came quite early on, the title, perhaps I should have kind of come back to it. And, uh, and uh, after the, the finished process and uh, make it more reflective of the process itself. I just, um, I suppose I'm really interested in, in the idea that, that I think the fact that, 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 that your, your work is wild, that you don't want to pin it down, you don't want to use, you want to resist the convention and tradition of academia, so hence you say, you know, I don't want to tell the reader what the questions are or what the aims are, but then I'm quite interested in terms of the reader's experience about a readable text, so that as much as I enjoy the space and the freedom that you're giving your reader, is that potentially problematic that we don't get a few signposts in the title or through research questions and aims that might make say this is this is what this work is about, this is Magda's expertise, this is the journey she's going to take me on through this work which will surprise me and be personal and, and wild. Um, and I just wondered if there's a bit of a tension there. Well, I guess that tension is also the point, create that tension because uh, if I want to do this, this is a gesture that tries to kind of uh, shift uh, the, the commonly accepted ways, then the, uh, uh, obviously it will create a tension. I'm trying to be a gentle <laughs> in that creating that tension, and I call myself also gentle or tender, nar tender narrator to kind of carry people or read them through the text. Uh, I think all of the elements that you mentioned are there uh, also. So. Uh, I resisted for a long time, to, or not resisted maybe, but I was thinking how to go about the introduction and introducing a reader to offering a, some sort of a map. I hope the introduction does that. The summary of the chapters, uh, I hope it does it, it does it sort of helps a little bit assist the reader. But I think if the tension is there, that's just, uh, that's just fine. <laughs> because otherwise it wouldn't be doing its work. And I'm, just trying to remind, I think, I don't know if I'm doing a good job in that, but throughout the process and the text, that um, it's okay to be confused and it's okay to not know and you can return to this. It's not a linear text. If you start from this chapter, you kind of will read it very differently and you can always return to it. 
So I guess the problem, the only problem that I might expect is that uh, we don't have enough time to read this kind of texts. We are uh, asked to read quickly and uh, so um, this is one reward, well, not only, but one of the worries <laughs> I have. The, the readers, uh, what I'm asking is too much attention and uh, time for the text. Um, um. I'm going to come back to that because okay. I, do, I do want to ask you some point. Do you think your reader needs to read your whole text right from the top of the video? We could talk about that, but I just, I just want to come back to the performance as well, and then, um, and then I'm going to prevent you should just mention that um, in the performance you say, I am not an academic. Can you let me know what you thought an academic was when you started this process and how perhaps that has shifted now? And I'd also like to ask how the performance augments the thesis and the strange dialogue that they have with each other. So, but I'll ask that question again, so I know I'll cheaply ask two questions there. <laughs> so do you want me now to address the, what, what I thought the academic was, sir? Yes, please. Yeah, this is kind of an imaginary, uh, uh, the image, of course, imagined, imagined idea I had in my head, and that's probably one thing that I also have, I have to sort of decolonize in, in internally, uh, but uh, it's, it's a lot about, I think it has a lot to do with uh, the lack of self-confidence <laughs> in learning a process and the way I came to be a teacher uh, and sort of the pursuit from being a student and being a teacher and being a doctoral student at the same time, which was kind of a process of becoming an, ex an academic, which in one sense meant for me to become a, becoming an expert. But then being thrown, for example, not thrown, but be, and ending up in a, in a uh, situation where I had to teach courses that felt uh, uh, I was not adequate for teaching. And uh, for, for pe meeting with people, I thought I wasn't adequate. So um, the, I think the, academic, the, the idea of the kind of academic uh, that I had was the one who has answers. When students ask, they would have, they would have answers. And especially in our context, Finnish international higher education, this is an important aspect that um, when uh, people from around the world come to study in Finland, study education in Finland, uh, as I did as well in the same program, the, the, the same program I was teaching it, uh, I felt like I have to kind of uh, fulfill a promise or fulfill an expectation, expectations of them coming and hoping for some answers that we might have here or some ideas. And it links to the, to the, the discourse, a very big discourse, global um, discourse that has been created around Finnish, Finnish education. And I felt inadequate in, in that sense. But yeah, so it links to the idea of an academic that I had very deeply ingrained was that uh, someone who has answers, some sort of answers, and who I have no questions. But this idea leads very deeply to the context, that's, uh, to, to my situation as a student, um, teacher and, and doctoral student at the same time, so still not an expert just yet, but put in the position of, of being an expert. So there was this internal dissonance uh, around this idea. And has that shifted at all now? Has, has, the, um, has the thesis, which is its own inquiry about you coming to understand your identity and your, yourself as a, as a teacher, as an educator, as a, as a human being, a, a little differently, has that been mission giving to see yourself as an academic, or is that inner critic still loud in your head? I, I I think it's yeah it, it shifted definitely but I just didn't think I need a label anymore I just feel like I need a, to be to call myself an academic or to call myself a teacher or to call myself artist to do things that move me that's the that's the video speaks to that so we're using these labels these boxes and these identity identity labels but I personally feel now that that space in between is a really nice space to be. <laughs> and though the tension is, of course, between that feeling of internal sort of sense and then what the world does to me, still using these labels, but 
I guess it's a process to work with, but yes, definitely, it has shifted. I don't feel like I need um, that kind of label. <laughs> That, I find that really persuasive at the moment. There's a, there's a writer, poet, former, using all the labels, so we just said that we, we want to kind of write against, um, called Travis Salabanza, and this, who's, who's from the UK. Um, and they, in their memoir, they talk about a similar thing, of the idea of labels being an excuse to separate us and put us in opposition with each other. I mean, I know we're meant to be in opposition today. Um, but the fact is actually problematic because you cannot then talk about things like decolonizing work yeah. or, work, or working together because there's too much talking about the boundaries and the labels that we want to give each other instead. So actually, I, I find your argument really persuasive. Um, and I just wonder if that could be kind of more amplified within the thesis as well. What do you, what do you, how do you feel about that? Maybe in the conclusion? Mm -hmm. Yeah. The sort of the, 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 the essential moving away from the essentials yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. mm. What what do you think? Uh, perhaps I could I could bring it back in the conclusions because because I think I do work with this idea a lot throughout. Because for me that means it is in betweenness and there's a lot of different dimensions of in betweenness. Um, so there's a sort of a really a, in, from Buddha it's a sort of you know, embodied <laughs> empty space in between. Then in, when I talk about uh, um, being uh, uh, thinking about being in a post from a post-socialist space, um, not quite Western, neither non-Western. That's another betweenness. Uh, and I, I, I think, in, at least in the chapters, I do well with those ideas quite a lot. Um, also, the in betweenness of disciplinary labels, uh, my struggle with finding the disciplinary uh, academic uh, home in a way, in terms of disciplines and theoretical affiliations. Uh, so maybe it could have been brought up, uh, brought back more um, stronger in a stronger way in the conclusion. So I suppose I suppose what I, uh, I think I think the idea that we stop using labels like academic if we, if, is is quite a radical idea. But also if we are serious about decolonizing academia, actually that is a, a really persuasive, provocative argument that I think is a, a, a and the idea that we you know, open up different spaces from which we can um, be writers, artists, mm. uh, thinkers, um, is, is a, a, a really compelling idea for other ways of being in academia. But I, and I know you're going to say, well, it is there because that's what I've taken away from it. But I just think it's another um, thing that you could celebrate as an outcome of your findings and a, an outcome of the work that you've done as well. Because I, I, I completely agree, and that's the kind of idea that I would want to share with, with students and colleagues as well. So to have it sort of um, uh, uh, pinned down, I know if we want to keep the text well, but slightly pinned down, I think, would be, would be a really um, really compelling part of the argument that you, you're developing here. Um, so, I just, so, so going back to this as well about how do you maintain a, a wild text whilst also wanting it to be um, accessible, um, and to allow readers to arrive at different conclusions and different questions as well. Um, do you, on, a, so on, on page 35, you say um, you ask us to let go of the means for ends and outcomes and allow your heart, body, and soul to teach you, and that it would be against the, the purpose of ethnography itself, which aims to make research more accessible and write in ways that cultivate readers, meaning communication with them, not above them or beyond them. Um, and I, I, I find that really persuasive, but actually, Throughout your text, you set up research questions. So, so you, you ask questions all the time. So I just wondered what was the what is the difference between kind of signposting these overarching questions and aims in the instruction and then um, having them throughout. So, uh, so so I've got I've got a list of about ten questions that you ask um, throughout the text. Um, but I'm just wondering about, even if it was to guide people through, just to set up kind of, these are questions that you might like to hold in your head and heart as you engage with the text. 
what do you think those questions and aims might be if they were just to be there as a guide? So from those questions that have emerged in the process and what I would bring into the maybe um, as a guide for the introduction. more yeah I think that one of the questions would be definitely uh, how are you made of colonial relations how are you made of how are you made of colonial relations so mm -hmm. how is your life uh, uh, yeah how are you complicit or you know what's what's the role there look, look internally and think yeah what is what is your city responsibility face. How are you made of? I, I like that phrase because we're all made of those relations. This is my, you know, the perspective I take. So that would be one question. Um, the other one would be perhaps uh, what is the, what is the, what is the, <laughs> that's a broad question, but uh, that's what is the, what is actually a, uh, what is the purpose of higher education? That's the point. That is one that we all be asking ourselves. Maybe I could have foregrounded more there. Um, but I, yeah, I think this is the resistance to actually pose the questions. It's the, um, maybe I trust the readers that they would, through the text, they arrive at these questions those uh, that are central for me and also many of their own um, so that maybe that's the reason why I'm at well, the only the only way I'm at, sorry the, the only thing I'm asking actually in the introduction is to, to, to try to slow down and really take time and, and, and engage like you said in the immersive text to sort of see the questions for themselves but if I would still bring uh, to, to, to aid the reader more um, so the, the colonial relations, the, the point of higher education, and also what is, uh, where is your body? Yeah. Where and, is, yeah. <laughs> and, and maybe perhaps how can, how can our research and pedagogy uh, hold that body, I yeah. suppose, too, it's something that came up as a result mm -hmm. of your pro I imagine you might have an eye roll at this, but I thought, and I brushed it was how can an autographic depot decolonize research and pedagogy in higher education? Mm -hmm. And for me, that is, a, that is about naming your territory as well, naming a specific term too. Um, and that was, but that was one of the things that I really took to work. So again, I suppose it comes back to this idea of labels and wanting to resist that. But how would you say, in, in, the, in this case, how does a thesis how is it distinct from a novel or an art exhibition or, or something else would you say? Or do you think those kind of mm -hmm. labels are unhelpful again? Mm -hmm. What is distinct about the thesis as a, as a form? As it is now, I think as I'm thinking now, this is not an answer to what would be, for example, a decolonized thesis look like, although I don't think there's such a thing. I don't think there's anything that can be labeled as decolonized mm -hmm. as finished. Mm -hmm. Um, but uh, as it is now, I think there is this need, deep engagement with, with um, theories, but theories are coming from all different places, so uh, deep, yeah, to, to sort of um, uh, deep engagement with, 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 with the knowledge that there is already and with um, with the ideas that are out there flowing, but I'm going to talk about theories that are necessary, only those coming from the books, but also those coming from the body, for example, mm -hmm. and the one that brings a from the philosophy in praxis. Um, so that would be probably one of those, those, those um, main things. Now that you said that you asked this question, I'm thinking perhaps, uh, and it links to what we talked just before, perhaps it needs to be more, uh, mm. more thoughtful of, uh, 
diversity of an academic community. So I'm asking something, reader, some specific sort of <laughs> attitudes and, and positions to approach the thesis. But perhaps I think be more thoughtful of a variety of readers that this will be sort of um, going to. And, and that brings me to the idea of thesis uh, as being different from a novel. Um, it's for a specific, specific uh, audience. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I, I might argue therefore that that's why the need for some guiding, supportive, um, aims and overarching questions might be useful for a reader and also help you to celebrate what it is that you're doing because I think how we can decolonize HE so that eventually maybe there is a such thing as a decolonized thesis is maybe one of the most important things we can do as researchers and, and why I think your work will inspire and transform um, research and pedagogy and why I'm, I'm grateful to you for, for doing this work because it's, it's inspired me further as well. Um, but, but yeah, that, that, that is what it came out. And also, so within that as well, I'm quite interested in, and I know you've used image and dance and, and the film too, but the privileging of text because how can we decolonize academia if we still privilege texts over all else to disseminate knowledge. What do you think? What are your thoughts about that matter? Mm -hmm. Last night I was thinking how I, uh, about the question, what would I do differently if I am doing mm -hmm. it again? And I wrote myself a note. I would dance more, write less. <laughs> Um, I think, for example, engaging with the uh, philosophy of dialogue with Martin Luther, I, could, I, I, I would, yeah, I could maybe do justice to that philosophy uh, through more creative work than writing about this mystic work or his mystic writing. Um, so yeah, I guess I'm guilty of being <coughs> sort of <laughs> co, yeah, co-opted into this uh, this. Uh, <laughs> Um, need to for words, uh, a need for writing. Yeah. I don't. I don't think that you're you're guilty, uh, but I think your work will open up new ways of being research, and and with that, I would like to see that celebrated more um, in the title and in some supportive aims and questions that we can approach your uh, your mighty um, and inspiring text with as well. Um, but, but yeah, I, I certainly don't need to work and think of you as being guilty about that, that's for sure. Um, I'm going to move on to, to the next question. I'm sorry, like I said, your, 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 your writing did inspire me to, to think a lot as you wanted it to, but, um, but maybe we'll come back to, to some of the things. So this is a, a rich model of what ethnography do you most align with, and how do you think you evolved that model? Um, could it be stated as a distinct method or approach, or so I said, could it be um, a living autoethnographic inquiry, which you, you use as a term on page one, or autoethnographic auto? Or, for example, would you or would you say something else instead? But, but what what kind of, what variety of autoethnography do you most align with, and how have you evolved that model? Is the core question there? Mm. Um, I explain the explain quite um quite thoroughly in, in the introduction, I think the, there are few strands, or at least two, that have influenced me uh, greatly, the performative one and the evocative one. Mm -hmm. And then the, sort of the critical, also the colonial ethnography that there's another label that is used. But I also very much resist those labels again. <laughs> so there are these influences, but I think that's in, in, especially when it comes to ethnography, which foregrounds the researcher, researcher's um, uh, place, or is, is the researcher is the researcher is an object of the study that, and the subject of the study. Uh, I think labeling is, is kind of um, unhelpful because that's always that's always all my particular. Um, strand of ethnography that I create. But definitely performative uh, ethnography has been very um, powerfully coming in the beginning when I, I was reading Harry Sprague, for example, and her embodied experiences and how she was bringing into 
the body actually onto the pages. Some of uh, her writing uh, was uh, viscerally impacting me. And I thought, okay, this is awesome. I can maybe find words to, to actually bring the body onto the page. Which actually is also, and, and similar with evocative strand, but I think that's more, yeah, this is a bit of a different influence, but um, uh, and I think this links also kind of to, to already what we talked just a moment ago about the words and producing words, because why I actually ended up working with so many, producing so many words is, was because I thought that, like I found a way for myself to write. That's, and it was amazingly liberating and, and transformative and beautiful and I loved writing <laughs> when I actually found the way of doing it. When I actually allowed really my body to write also. Uh, and when I have this video body that writes me, it's, it's, it's very difficult to put into words but I feel like it was words often coming from deep, deep in the body. Sometimes I wouldn't even remember what I wrote because it was mm -hmm. just coming from a very different place. And this also is very similar to what happens, for example, in Bhutto uh, work, Bhutto dance. It's a very sort of deep, meditative, a very deep listening state. You do something, uh, and the head is out there. It's, it's gone, and you don't remember what you do. And when I found that this actually works for writing as well, it was amazing. It was such an interesting, nice, <laughs> and beautiful process to, to engage in. So, uh, and that links me to, to, for example, the performative and evocative uh, strands of other novelty, which, which um, come from the body. I mean, the words really do come from the body. Mm. Um, yeah, and the critical, critical strand, if you want to use that label, uh, because it was really important uh, not to stay uh, on that, let me say, the, on, this, on the self, but also make the self uh, well, that's the whole point. That's the whole difference between autobiography and autobiography, let's say. That I'm not just talking about myself for the sake of talking about myself. It is very helpful and, uh, and, and, and transformative on a personal level. But the whole point is also to say something uh, and change perhaps something uh, on a social cultural level, right? So the critical strand is important because it makes, emphasizes making personal political. So that well, I, I do agree with you, but your idea of what that would be is already an idea of itself um, as an artist, I would say, is, is, is quite highly evolved. Um, and I'm just thinking of, say, your students who come to read this work, or um, people who come who want to decolonize academia and use new ways of being in academia and celebrate their own identity through their writing. But actually, they might need more of a structure or more of a framework to help them learn and to develop the confidence to do that work as well. And I just think that actually describing your and, and not necessarily in a you know bullet pointed way or a, a way that kind of adheres to the conventions of um, describing your model or your approach, but actually maybe doing it through um, aligning it with with a type of dance or aligning it with nature as you've done so so well elsewhere in the pieces. I just wonder if there's a way of saying this is my autobiographic approach that then other people it might guide people into doing their own decolonizing work or writing <coughs> themselves. Um, because I don't think they will have the evolved kind of um, ideas and sense, not not all of them that you are saying. So that idea of you know you have to find out for yourself. I agree, that's what education should at best do. But, but I just feel there should be some, a, a bit of a scaffold in place to support people who will want to learn from your work and develop it as well. And so I just wonder if you've got any ideas around that for how you might be able to define your method in a way that would feel awkward or unpleasant to you. Mm, I think that's um, something to work with for future. And deriving my own <laughs> label <laughs> of <all> the work. <laughs> um, I, I, I can't put, a, put one word on, on my approach at the moment. I think I, I, yeah. I don't imagine it would be one word. I imagine mm -hmm. it would be a kind of, you know, a, a, a recipe or a, um, mm -hmm. a, a, some kind of dance um, routine or a, or a call within a poem or something 
something like that. So not something that is uh, dry, bloodless, um, <laughs> uh, but, but, but something that would still give people something to look at. Say, so, oh, I, I see. That's the that's the uh, that's the approach. That's something that I can build on. That's something I can I can use as a springboard into what I want to do. Mm -hmm. So, for example, a, a lot of my work I use and. Um, uh, uh, Chang's collaborative water technology to again to think about dialogue with other people. So, so I look at their model and then I think about how I can dismantle it and, and rebuild it to suit my own um, my own my own intentions, I suppose. And I I do think that your approach is um, distinct and important, and actually that would be really useful for people coming to water technology to, to learn from you and be inspired by you. But that it needs a bit more scaffold to, to help new auto technologies get there. I'll be working on that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I, might, I might ask for a little bit more of that for now. Um, so let, let's go to the structure goals again. I think your, your structure is really um, potentially inspiring for um, the, the new researchers and, and people coming to auto technology, but not just auto technology, people wanting to do research differently, whether that's auto technographic work or something else. Um, and you talk about um, this, so also you say the four seasons of the solar cycle are a typical year in subarctic continental climate in which I'm geographically led paces. Um, but why are the seasons right for this, do you think? Why, I mean, why the seasons as opposed to um, some other organic um, structure, you know, the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the uh, uh, a classic of single, um, the life cycle of a raindrop or something like that, for example, the water cycle. Why particularly a season's right for this work? Perhaps um, this, this came, uh, <coughs> it, it didn't come early on. Um, I think it emerged around the beginning of the pandemic. And uh, we were working a lot at home, and uh, my desk is facing, um, or just to the right, there's a, there's a garden where I work a lot as well. I enjoy doing the, that work. And, and I was, that, 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 the big, the, that year was basically when, when, when most of the writing happened. And I was just very, very aware of this changing landscape and um, I was aware before but during the pandemic when it was kind of frozen in place and for a year or so um, I was teaching less and writing more and actually kind of this came to me it's kind of come and, and it because of the few years I was working on it and it was a kind of a cycle I, I've noticed that when I could write when I was a bit more busy with something else and it was kind of coming that the autumn was the, 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 the beginning of the teaching and it sort of writers and thrown out <laughs> on the side and then another time so, so uh, this of course links to the nature cycles but also to the sort of uh, the seasons as um, manifested in for example the workings of an institution which season being kind of marked by different kinds of activities autumn beginning of the academic year and then winter sort of being the time of going deep into teaching and uh, summer being the time for the academics to go into the conferences for example yeah and so that's what, but that that's a sort of a, another dimension of this nature cycle i think the main one was that i was very um more present in the nature during the the, the, the period of the most intense writing and also because I felt often that the nature was my refuge from writing, where I felt like I, the, the language in this oppressive terms was coming in, so I, oh, I can't put these ideas into the way that I imagine should be put in a uh, literal dissertation, doctoral dissertation. When I got into those places, the nature was always there for me. And the distinctiveness of the seasons in Finland and the distinctiveness also of activities that we engage in when we, for example, keep a garden, each season having a very clear um, set of things you need to do, and, and which brings a lot of ideas about. Yeah. 
new life emerging and pandering the garden and autumn as we are now kind of dying and going to hibernation in a very, very long winter when there's actually, mm, you know, you can imagine Finnish winter is kind of a, um, also a very specific experience and somehow I felt this was, it very, it felt, it felt in my body very strongly that there was this, uh, and it, it was very also soothing that it's, because it lasted, the, the writing itself maybe for about four years, that there is always a, a, a comeback. So that it's a, it's a it's a circular. Mm-hmm. So there is this cycle, and it's soothing that you always know that it's gonna come back. So now everything is dying, but it's dying just so to be born again in the spring. And I don't know. I just felt this very deeply in my body, and because I was writing from the body, it felt like this was something that that kind of cyclical spiral structure would, um, would reflect the process quite well. Hmm. Um, I think the distinctiveness uh, of the, na- the seasons in Finland and also because being so close with the nature through the garden work, that was one of the uh, reasons why the seasons came up as a perhaps sort of a way, although I was wondering for a long time whether it's too, too a cliche idea, <laughs> because it's a, uh, but then I thought, well, it is, this is something yes. that <laughs> felt right to me that it came from my experiences of writing. But what I must admit, when I first saw it reduce the seasons, my instinct was to have a, a gentle recoil, but actually I think you do something surprising in the seasons, you do, it doesn't feel, um, Labored and it doesn't feel simplistic. I feel that you do something quite nuanced and complex with using the seasons. That is, and, and the, the, the overarching narrative about mushrooms as well, I've really thoroughly enjoyed. I, I, um, I, 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 and the, 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 the similarities between being an academic and being a mushroom um, I, I'm very favorable as well. So thank you for that. But I do wonder uh, if this can somehow be and um, uh, uh, and harness isn't the right word because of course that feels like it's being said, but somehow used to, to demonstrate your particular approach to your technology. So that idea of the cyclical nature of the seasons, how that might be used as a wild way to um, say this is my particular approach to what ethnographic research as well that will be that, that would be that, you know which would be really accessible to, to future readers and writers as well. Um, but, but but also the idea that academia needs rewilding, you know, the, the impact of neoliberalism on, on academia uh, means that our connection with nature and the need for it to be, you know, to be wild spaces in our research and our pedagogy as well is, is really important and, and so I found that very persuasive and, and I enjoyed hearing you talk about it today as well, so thank you. Um, also I want to talk about, as you mentioned, the poetic inquiry in the, um, in the, in the thesis as well. And I just wondered, is this uh, poetic inquiry? And it, 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 is, is that because it, it, as a term in the thesis, it feels it's just kind of mentioned, but it's not linked to a particular approach or uh, somebody else's work. So I just wondered if you felt that this was a poetic inquiry or just aspects of it were. And if it is a poetic inquiry, um, how, do you, how do you identify it as being, I suppose? Perhaps it is not a poetic inquiry as such as it as is defined by by those um, scholars who work with that uh, approach as such. Uh, but poetic writing, perhaps, uh, as a way of writing that I found um, to address certain things, maybe that would be the, the better, better name for it. Uh, poetic writing in terms of um, Finding the space, finding the silence in the text. Finding the silence in the text. Finding the silence between the words. So this links also to the title. For me, perhaps this could be more explicitly stated, but the threading gently between the words and the worlds. The between the words is exactly uh, is exactly about the poetic writing and poetic being in the world. So um, not being uh, always compelled to produce a mass 
of words that can explain, analyze, describe the situation, but withdraw uh, and throw only those tiny drops of words where there's more silence, and, and, but it actually produces a lot of meanings uh, for whoever is in the, in the encounter with that kind of writing. Um, so that's, that's, I think, how poetry worked for me, this poetic writing and being, it's, I don't, yeah, perhaps it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a I, don't, I don't think I, yeah, if I call it like an inquiry, uh, I don't use poetry uh, as perhaps in such way as, um, as those um, scholars who work with that. But, but, but see again your description there so, so I agree the idea that poetry has that space on the page that there's the gaps between text and um, that there is space to breathe in poetic words as well again I think is a, a really important and, and, and the way you describe about it there I think you could see more of in the, the thesis itself uh, and, and why permission to, to breathe in um, the work that we do and how we present that work as well is, is really important. And I think poetry offers something that traditional academic work doesn't. So again, I, I'd just like to see that maybe amplified um, in the text as something something really important that you've done with your writing and with your work as well, given the space to bring through your use of poetic inquiry. Um, so yeah, so, so again, just book, turn, turn, up the, uh, turn up the volume on up too. Um, so the next one is going to be page 20, you say, um, you mentioned something about um, uh, honesty in autobiographic storytelling. So I just wanted to ask you, do you think honesty is important in autobiography? Um, and also because you use writing in such an interesting way throughout the thesis, and you tell a very impactful um well articulated, creative, evocative story. So is what's important to you here? Is it something about truth or is it something about creating a collage of lived experience that tells a fantastic story? And I think that collage of fantastic story is some sort of a form of truth. Yeah? Can you tell me more about that? And you ask if honesty is important to talk about the it's important in life, so how can it be not important in autobiography? I had a student once telling me that I'm too honest. <laughs> I remember this course really, really well. Um, yeah, it's, it, it is a, yeah. I suppose what I mean is, when, when you write autobiography, are you trying to hold up a mirror on your experience, or is, does it matter if that mirror is blurry, um, imaginary? Um, is 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 the idea that we present something that is as as truthful as factual as possible, or does it need to be rooted in honesty and truth? I suppose is what I'm getting at here. Yeah, yeah, rooted in honesty and truth, definitely not, and not trying to to to, to pretend that it can be provide an objective representation of some sort of reality, because obviously there. Are we are beyond that assumption that you know, the text can be <laughs> represent objectively and in some sort of pure form the uh, objectively existing reality. So yes, it rooted in honesty and, 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 and the drive and the need for truth seeking. It doesn't have to be truth, but it has to be driven or should be driven by the genuine need to seek the truth. And that's why we're answers, where our questions come up and not answers. And um, I love this quote from my uh, from one of the Polish novelists, uh, Olga Pogarczuk, who, who talks about truth is is a question, not an answer. So there is this that that's where honesty and genuine ingenuity and authenticity comes in. So it doesn't. So in a sense, what comes up if this is sort of uh, that kind of writing, then it does deliver some sort of truth, uh, or truths maybe, and it also, but it's also important that it opens up a space for generating new truths, whoever comes into this writing. And if you can sense that it's coming from this deep, deep, and that's why 
listening, <laughs> slowing down and listening is important because you can sense whether the ethnographic work comes from this deep place of honesty and, and deep search for truth. Uh, then um, I think it, it has then the potential to, to, to do something in the reader. I completely agree, and, and, and what you've just said there, I, I totally agree with. Uh, and maybe uh, that could be used just to, just to, just to, just to augment um, that part of the, the thesis as well, because yeah, exactly what you just said, completely agree. Um, uh, so, uh, so the next question is, um, uh, Marcy, you, you say at one point in the thesis um, that you, I, I have heard, this is just your PhD, just get it done so you can move on to any to other things. This is just a driving license for academia, permission to enter the academic discussion room. Um, and I wanted to ask you about gatekeepers in academia. I mean, is that inevitable? Is it that we're, we're inevitably going to feel like we're, we're trying to um, get permission to move on and through academia, whether it's uh, you know, peer review or funding applications or um, a viva, I suppose, too? Um, so, so is, is that inevitable? And what might the next era of academia look like? And how can world technology be part of that? That is a big question. Right? Yes. How can, will we ever kind of eliminate the need for the gatekeepers? Are they an essential part of academia? And what might the next era of academia look like? And how can world technology be part of it? That is a small question, yes. <laughs> 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 Let me link it back to the to what I said about there's no such thing as decolonized anything. Mm -hmm. And to my idea, which I really hold on dearly to uh, this work and everything I do being a gesture, just a small gesture. So I don't know if, if it's possible to get rid of the gatekeeping and all these issues that you mentioned. I don't know. But I know that I can do little gestures towards that. And that is what decoloniality, thinking of decoloniality, and doing what decoloniality is. So I don't talk about decolonizing anything, but thinking through these lenses, how we are made of coloniality slash modernity, and how, for example, the, all the structures that we, you just identified as being problematic are made of that, those colonial, colonial relations, how uh, thinking in everything we do, so in a, it's not about coming up with some prescription, right? It's just being hyper attuned and hyper aware of in everything what we do in our life, in academia and beyond. Uh, it, yeah, how, how, how I, what I do uh, works towards the elimination of those, those problems or reinforces and reproduces. So I'm not going to say any, I, I'm not, I will, I will, I will avoid to giving uh, some sort of prescriptions or trying to even imagine if the, the, a different academia is possible. But because I'm still here and because I've done this work and because I really hope to stay here for some time at least, uh, I guess I do imagine some sort of different way. But uh, I'm not going to not paint a picture how it looks like right? because we can't know that. What we can do, I think, is just to gesture every day with our with our writings, with our work, with our meetings with students, with uh, trying to do research and pedagogies differently. Um, but I think, yeah, there is a danger to kind of try to imagine how it looks look like because uh, there is a danger to them to kind of leave ready recipes to follow. And I think this is so strongly emphasized in the, by the colonial thinkers that you can't do that because you then end up doing exactly what the coloniality did in the first place. Well, I would agree, but what do you think what have done, how do you think what have done be can contribute to that? Because rather well, than a, this is how we must all do it, or this is how it should be done, mm. how can all have done be, um, yeah. be part of be part of what I'm saying? And for, for, that yeah. maybe for me, it sharpens that it's it's one one potential of what ethnography is to kind of sharpen that awareness, to kind of uh, practice that uh, being conscious, being aware of, of what we do and how it 
you know, fits in and how it departs from those those structures of trying to be uh, trying to challenge. So okay, that's why really uh, in, also in the in the lecture in the beginning, I talk about ethnographic being. Not necessarily, I don't now call everyone to go and write an autobiography, but that's not the point. The point is to kind of be in that, maybe a little bit leave that mode. And I do really resonate with the writers who talk about autobiography being a mode of leaving, not just a research approach, but mode of leaving in the world. Because that allows to, to see how the personal is political and, and recognize that and also see if because that's also the part of the colonial, colonial thinking of coloniality. It, on one hand, requires us to uh, recognize those complicities, but at the same time as we recognize those complicities, something happens and we, if we are good people, <laughs> I mean, if, if, if we want to change something, something happens through that recognition that you want to do things differently. So it's sort of a, a evokes a gesture, a decolonial gesture, as you recognize your, your complicities. So maybe that I would imagine just, uh, that if I could imagine having it differently, I would slow it down, first of all. Yes, please. <laughs> <laughs> I would slow it down because you can't do, you can't sort of engage in that, um, reflexive process, and I'm not talking only about thinking, but exactly uh, embodied reflexive process, and creative practices, and so on, to engage creative, creative practices. Um, yeah, so it, I think we need to slow down, and that's, maybe then we could move to some, or, or through slowing down, we could move towards different academia. Um, thank you, I, I agree. Um, and, and actually, I think what you just said is how I thought ethnography might be able to contribute to this because rather than saying this is what everyone should be doing or this is the future, rather what we can is say, well, this is what I am doing, as well, these are the small gestures I am making and hope that they might have resonance for other people. So um, the idea of um, slowing down or using um, for the seasons as a way of structuring our academic writing or <laughs> using dance, you know, things like that will um, inspire and encourage other people to feel connected to something that gives them permission to say, well, this is what I'm doing as well, so that therefore we then have a collective responsibility that we, we share stories of what we do in our own practice with the colonizers as well, which, which I think is perhaps the best thing for technology can, can offer higher education. Um, and yes, I'm, I'm completely there for the down when we can. Um, so, um, so I just wanted to, to move on to the, um, the next question. Um, so, so, so you um, say at one point in the, in the thesis, um, I have done my best not to hurt anyone. And I wanted to talk a little bit about the ethics of story in ourselves and story in others um, in the text. So do you quote, um, Andrew Sparks, who um, is, is somebody that I um, look up to in my technology as well, who talks about the idea of making sure other people aren't um, recognisable in the text if, if they, unless they've given informed consent. So I just wondered what, what were the ethical considerations around storying, not just yourself, but also students and people at conferences and taxi drivers. Um, in the text, and, and, and other than doing what when you say I've done my best not to hurt anyone, what actually does that mean in terms of an ethical approach to this work? Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is an essential uh, question that has been with me throughout the process. So there's also that, that uh, it sharpens the, the, the ethnographic inquiry, sharpens the awareness that this is a question that runs throughout. From, from the very beginning and not just something that you address in the end of the research process mm -hmm. um, by pointing out how I took care of the consents and so on. So um, I do really um, work with this um, idea of Car Caroline Ellis of um, con con continuous um, 
ethical thinking uh, and to process consensus in the way. And of course, uh, my story is never my own story only. And uh, there's a whole world of other uh, people and, and non-human beings that is involved in my in my stories. And but definitely, as I write, I think in, in winter chapter opening, that felt most um, problematic or most kind of relevant uh, when I came to that chapter when I write stories. Uh, about my encounters with the students. And uh, um, there was a, actually uh, in the beginning of that year, uh, or in words, that, that particular year where these stories come from mainly, uh, we had students to uh, sign a certain um, general uh, consent for which we could use, um, we could use the, their, it was a very generic one, sort of general one, just to use their work for the purposes of development of our program. So they all signed those consent. Uh, but of course, since we didn't never know what is actually going to happen in the courses and what we're going to use and so on, that would have to be um, always then asked again. And um, and in the in the process, of course, I didn't know what I'm actually going to end up writing about, what will become the important things. And, uh, but I did engage students in reading the texts uh, when I wrote them. Some of those students that uh, have uh, specifically talked to me more, and this is some of those uh, discussions that we had that are actually used in the, in the story, in, in, in winter chapter. And I did uh, have a lot of conversations with them and also send them the, the, that chapter uh, to read and we had, a, we had an exchange there uh, and it was very interesting also how, what it did to them uh, and, and I remember one student really, really becoming aware of why she was a little bit uncomfortable with reading and then two days later she wrote me an email ah oh, but actually it's because I have these ideas it was something that she turned towards herself also thinking no actually this is me in the problem like it's kind of a lot don't have a problem with you writing this but me reading it and feeling uncomfortable about it uh, was then she started sort of going into herself and thinking ah maybe there's some work I have to do so this was very interesting but there was this exchange of, of, of texts with students um, conversations and uh, but one way of course I'm trying to avoid uh, directly writing about it is the form of the fictionalized uh, meeting where um, the, yeah, there, there's sort of a composite voice there. I think some of course some of those who were involved would recognize their were own words but trying to, it's, it's very sort of <laughs> it's very turned around it's a very composite composite um, composite voice um, but the, I think the one of the big questions that I uh, was sitting with um, and thinking quite a lot towards the end, especially in terms of the ethics, was about that, it's, that maybe the biggest problem is not so much that people that there are some people can be identified as such, but it's um, I can't now remember it's also Andrew Sparks quote that. Um, uh, your, that the writing can make uh, people see themselves or recognize themselves in the ways that they don't necessarily um, might like. <laughs> but um, that has to do, of course, again with this whole idea of the colonial work mm -hmm. and yeah. that it will make us uncomfortable. Uh, of course, I don't have any uh, entitlement to make anyone uncomfortable, but uh, sometimes avoiding at all costs making people uncomfortable may actually compromise the very um, underlying. Um, if you try to avoid at all costs to. Um, writing about some people because you might make them uncomfortable, then you risk, run a risk that you won't actually do, sort of provoke these uncomfortable situations at all. 
And we have to become uncomfortable if we're talking about seriously decolonizing anything. So, and but this is also I try to <laughs> be tender and offer the offer myself out there that I am here also when you read it and you feel uncomfortable and you hate me for <laughs> these things because you see yourself in an uncomfortable way. I'm here. We can talk and we can meet and we can be and sit together silently, not talking at all. That's so sad. <laughs> but it's a uh, oh, sorry. Mm. No, not before I actually talk to you. Um, I was gonna, so it's interesting that you um, both Carolyn Ellis, who um, in your ethnographic eye and also the work with um, the fishing community, uh, she then was critiqued for, for revealing intimate um, lives in some way. And I do wonder at Thought Tech Office, we do have a responsibility to be reflective when we about the stories that we write and use that to inform our author companies going forward as well. I just yesterday I read a story to my students where I wrote myself as a fairy tale character when I talked to my cat and one of my students said, but you don't really talk to a cat do you? And I was a bit like, oh I <laughs> 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 resolution to some of the ethical dilemmas of writing or ethnographically because you you use uh, such a range that actually individual people not that they're lost in a negative way but they're being stored because you're using the craft to such a high level that they become um, sort of um, they become imaginated in the text as opposed to it and I do think that that again is a very uh, a, a, a very positive thing about your work and your thesis and what it offers to autotopathy as a method. As I said in the beginning, I don't think it's enough just to say this is a story that happened to me that was transformative or challenging or upsetting. And, and what one of the delights of your thesis is just how deftly you wield every single craft and genre and style of writing that you apply to the thesis as well. Um, and, and for me, that's so innovative and um, motivating and inspiring and does offer autobiography a, a real way of, of progressing. And I just wonder, what is your writing process? So um, how is it, uh, do you use a critical friend? Uh, do you write sort of nine to five in a desk, <laughs> in a on a bus? Um, how does your, how, how your writing process actually manifest? Because I think there is potentially a lot to learn from, from that process. So I'd, I'd love to hear. I have to say, I surprised myself with the. You, you talk so beautifully about the, the genres and the way I, I write, and I have to say, I surprised myself a lot with that. So what I have, for example, allow is to cry in front of the screen as I'm writing. Generally, I, uh, surprise myself with finding right that kind of my surprising. Um, and so it's very difficult to talk about the process because I don't think I have reflected on that enough yet. Because it's <laughs> such a surprise. Uh, but definitely uh, something that I emphasize in the in the conclusions, I think I'm not trying to fight some sort of or, or um, fight with the text in a sense. Go go really with the rhythm of, of what my body needs and my integrated mind body and, and and spirit needs at the very moment to actually write and what it needs to write and how it needs to write and uh, giving into that rhythm was very very important. So. Uh, which of course goes a little bit against uh, you know, certain deadlines you were supposed to meet and so on. But I had a very, um, it's a very nice, um, gentle push in that sense um, for my supervisors. So it was not too uh, too stressful in that sense. So I could keep in the rhythm of writing, and I. 
oftentimes when I felt like um, yeah, it, the body is the comes to the rescue. Yeah, the body comes to the rescue always when I felt like I'm stuck or this doesn't make any sense or this is a jumble bumble and this there's no point to pour all these words and it. I don't know if a lot of people experience that, but I have very physical experience of that moment of stuck, being stuck at the screen and sort of I'm feeling like the whole sort of upper body is almost like physically, yes, uh, resisting writing. And I learned to finally listen to this signs and really go away and, and, and go shout, cry, dance, whatever in my living room or go shout, dance or dig in the ground in my garden or uh, do whatever what's needed to be done. Um, and so a variety of different um, dance experiences and yoga practices and so on that really helps. And I stopped thinking about it as just a way to get better so I can go back to writing, but actually as an, in an inherent part of the writing process that I need to listen to my body and trust because over and over again, when it happened, I just returned to the screen or I would write it somewhere and just, then just things came out. Came. And I was so surprised over and over again. And then sometimes things just came, I would leave it and I wouldn't <laughs> remember that I wrote something like that even. So it, it, um, it's very difficult to pinpoint some sort of um, uh, strategies or, or somehow describe this process in a nice way because I think I'm very surprised myself with this process, how it came up and uh, with the ways that I, I like. So maybe I need to a little bit uh, take distance um, from that and then think a little bit more and it would be interesting to discuss more the <laughs> process itself. Well, it's just from what you're saying as well, it, it, it's so, um, it's Probably parallel to the thesis, you know, that idea of a lot. I mean, like the seasons, like nature, it's surprising. Sometimes things happen that we know are going to happen, and sometimes there's these you know, things grow or emerge that kind of take us by surprise or grow in a direction we hadn't expected as well. So, I see a distinct parallel between your writing process and the overarching structure of the, the, of the thesis, too. And also, that this is another part of decolonizing writing that. You know, academic writing is seen very much as you know something that is done in silence, in you know, in, a, in an office, and 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 that we were just expert to sit down and get on with it because that's what academics should be able to do. Um, and I think an insight into your writing process um, is a gift. You know, I think I think it is um, and a, a, a unique part of this thesis as well. So I I did. Reading up, so I hope Magda said something about her writing process in the thesis. Um, and I suppose I still wish that to an extent, but if not, then certainly in some kind of publication, in reflection, mm -hmm. having done the, the doctoral work, I would think would be would be um, really worth kind of uh, producing and publishing as well. Um, and that's not just a narcissistic uh, <laughs> desire. I think it, it, I think again, this is something that you offer. Um, or technology and decolonizing academic work as well. So, so, so I, I hope you can do something like that. Um, I've got I've got more questions. I'm just going to keep going if that's okay. If you need to, to, to have some water or or, 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 or anything, do do just say. Um, so, so at the very heart of your work is this idea um, of decolonizing, I suppose, and how we can use strange, uncomfortable dialogues to, to do this work as well. <coughs> um, and, and I'm just wondering about, you know, uh, uh, in terms of decolonizing, and I know you're, this is, you're going to say, you're asking me to give it a label or something again as well, but what do you think are your key findings about, um, and what, as, as a, your auto ethnographic self, so not here is what everyone should be doing, but what would you tell yourself now is important about decolonizing in academia and, and, and writing? What are the key things that you would say? Slowing down, what I mentioned earlier, really <laughs> and recognizing these different temporalities that uh, uh, shape our work. 
that the sort of uh, why, why there is a need for slowing down because we are sort of structured by this uh, linear, very sort of outcome-oriented um, uh, way of thinking and working, and and uh, continuously uh, accelerating for some reason. I don't know why it kind of seems to be accelerated. The, it seems like the more pressing uh, problems the world faces, the faster we want to be. Obviously, finding questions, but I think. This is uh, actually the opposite should be done. We should be slowing down. So this is definitely one uh, one thing for me, and it does link to the colonial work because um, yeah, because of this modern linear time that we live by, and our lives are structured. Um, but also not to kind of think about it that this has to replace another ways of being. So I also learned to that not to fight with this linear, fast-paced temporality that, for example, um, higher the universities are work with. I started to kind of recognize that I can uh, navigate between these temporalities. And so that's where I'm talking about the world's coexisting. So I can make it my work myself. So then it's a, so that's important part in terms of decoloniality that we're not replacing something with something else, creating another sort of oppressive relation, but that we find our own ways without destroying the, <laughs> the sort of without creating the opposition towards the thing that we're working against. And that's for me very that's that helped the whole process really helped to recognize that that I don't have to do this or that or be this or that but I can sort of make my own space that bring all these worlds together. And so I can be uh, in, in, in sort of pushed in terms of some, um, I don't know, structures that university may need to push, or I may be constrained by, let's take a silly example, of 90 minutes of a class, time slot, 90 minutes. But I can take that and work with that, and they make it my own, and, and sort of bring that, that slowness, for example, within that structure anyway. So this was important, that it's not like a work against creating another opposition, but creating those spaces where all these different worlds can coexist, really. So truly pluralizing, not universalizing, or replacing one universal narrative with another, um, which I think decolonizing is often accused of, and decolonizing efforts are often um, predict for that. Okay, so what you um, are now offering, yes, we're just replacing one perspective with another, and another, another totalizing narrative. Mm -hmm. So I think the, in the process, um, in my, yeah, so in, in this ethnographic process, that became very uh, tangible, that you can do it. And when I do it my way, the world, you know, it's, it's, it's it, the world will go on, <laughs> It's not going to collapse, but I can do it. Uh, right? And what I think autobiography allows is to kind of really stop and zoom on those tiny, tiny moments, little things that you, in the ground <laughs> scale of things, might seem very uh, insignificant. But when you realize that you can actually do it differently, that is a completely that is changing the world as well, because from then on, you, you are a totally different person and everything you do. So I think really, and that's where the in-betweenness in also comes. So that's recognizing all these different worlds that shape me, that make me, and then creating my own sort of <laughs> mesh out of that the spaces as, as it's needed in the different parts of my life and in different um, stages of a day, or, but that all of it can be one. Mm. That's why I'm not talking about belonging. This is also an important um, difference, and I, I think this is one of the biggest findings that we also hear in this video we showed in the, in the beginning, that uh, it's not belonging that I long, because that means I would, be, I would long belonging to, uh, belonging to a certain world or label or category or box but wholeness that you can sense that whatever all these different worlds that they can, you can hold and you can bring them mm. all together. So also, mm. for example, uh, bridging professional public with personal life, right? So it's again not either or but um, 
get the fullness. Because I think yes. it's the, that fragmentation is one of the of our worlds is one of the biggest um, diseases, perhaps, or some some illnesses uh, of modern. I completely agree, and again, I think this is something that you could amplify just a little bit because I would argue that your approach to technology is about recognizing those kind of fragments and those moments when we, when we do feel disconnected from mind, heart, body, community, um, but actually through the writing we can re-establish or find time to at least notice um, that separation as well and, and use our creativity to, to hopefully bring that back together as well. So again, I think that is a distinct autobiographic approach that could be um, could be uh, detailed um, more, more assertively. And I expect it seems to go against treading gently, but um, and also this idea of um, that this is why autobiographic work is and doesn't have to be um, inward facing, but actually it can contribute to dialogue around well-being, around decolonizing, around um, kind of other ways of being in academia as well, and, and the environment actually as well, with all work details too. So, um, so yes, so, so I think some of these, some of these important parts of the work that you're doing are slightly muted at the moment in your thesis, and I wonder if maybe either in the thesis or in the work you've got to do that, that heat could be turned up. Um, underneath them and, and just celebrated a bit more because I find it really persuasive and inspiring myself. Um, and that's actually that's, uh, uh, something I wanted to um, ask a, a little bit more about as well. So, um, so, so, so um, I've got a couple of other questions, but I'm going to, I'm going to move on to, 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 to this one. Um, uh, you say that it, uh, we need these kind of um, uncomfortable conversations that your work has, has kind of generated. But what do you hope will, so, so thinking about people that will come and read your work and be inspired by your work, what do you hope, and forgive me, I'm going to deliberately use a pun here, what will mushroom out of your work for people that read it, do you think? What do you hope, what do you, what do you hope will, will come next? Yeah, I hope for those strange dialogues to continue. So, like a mushroom, if I continue with this metaphor, it's, it's a beautiful living organism. Uh, you never know where it's going to come. There's an underlying in mycelium, my, mycelium, mycelium in, under the ground, but that full mushroom fruit itself, you never know where it's going to come. That's why it's so exhilarating to go to the forest and search for them. And when you find them, it's just, I don't know, I'm not feeling hard to describe. So I'm hoping for this kind of uh, exhilarating finding, <laughs> finding those exhilarating moments when you actually some uh, some strange uh, encounters come, encounter uh, are uh, triggered by this uh, work. So that's my only hope that it's um, and also even if I don't this is this is interesting. Also, if I'm not explicitly hearing that. If it triggers something for the reader in, internally, and they want to just stay with it, and you know something shifts or something is caused, that's already great. I don't need to sort of be part of explicitly, uh, overtly part of the dialogue. So um, that kind of silent response, although of course I can't know it uh, happens, but I would hope that it happens. If I if I never hear about it, <laughs> mm -hmm. so um, because it's also I think silence is also a form of response, and I, I do also reflect a lot on silence in the work, and this has been very very important um, concept phenomenon to me because um, yeah in, in those those strange dialogues are often silent dialogues and. Um, when I think about going back to uh, your question about writing process, I felt like it had to come often from the place of silence, deep, deep silence, the writing. So then I started thinking, well, okay, if the words come from a deep place of silence, then the response can also be silent. Because 
I mean, what else would be the response, right? How to respond to something that comes from silence other than the silence? So, uh, so that one hope is just that, and I'm fine if I don't know this or I'm not aware, but if it happens, I only hope that you know, if one person gets a little bit <laughs> somehow triggered, it's, that's all my hope. And of course, we'd love to also engage in, in actual um, over dialogues as well. Mm. I think um, the idea of silence being a kind of uh, resistance or a kind of activism um, is really interesting and that there might be something, not now for the thesis, but something, because um, poetry does seem to be a kind of natural place to, to capture silence, but how can academic work be more bold, agile as well, do you think? Can you repeat, sorry, I didn't hear the last one. So your idea of, of silence being a, a, a form of resistance and a form of activism, I would say, as well. We, we talked earlier about how poetry might be a, 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 a suitable style of writing for capturing that. But how can academic writing become more bold, more agile, and create spaces for breathing or slowness? The silence, do you think? They're not just in poetry, but other ways of being in academic writing. You mean from the perspective, think of the perspective of an individual academic or the sort of a structural? I feel more as a kind of, more as a kind of thinking about work that might come next, work that might emerge as a result of being inspired by your own writing. How do you think active writing might evolve to absorb and include some of these things? Not to be pushed to publish, first of all. <laughs> <laughs> because, I mean, if you want to generally write in that way, it cannot be coming from a place of a pressure to produce in the first place. Yeah? So there is that pressure, and that only production is rewarded, and those other ways of uh, being are not rewarded, and that's really have to meet these systems of some sort of recognition as well, and obviously um, call funding schemes and so on. But I think. Uh, so, um, yeah, not to be, it cannot come from a place of uh, pressure. Um, and just, uh, Do you mean a pressure not to publish at all, or not just to publish in particular um, stars, mm. journals, and places like that? Because we want our writing to connect with people, don't we? So, so how might, what, what, how would you like the writing to connect with people if not through being published, I suppose? No, I don't see, uh, I don't need to move away from the publishing, but I think it's about, well, what's the point, right? Again, yeah. I'm linking to the question, the broader question I voiced earlier, what's the point of higher education in general? So maybe it's all about that, it's not about, again, getting rid of something that we see as wrong, but kind of adopting it and uh, bending it and twisting it to, to um, what, we, what we think is, is, uh, is, is sort of a different way, it could be a different way. Um, but if we could, um, yeah, I think bringing yourself to the, to the writing more, even if it's a work or whatever other kinds of research, it doesn't have to be explicitly autobiographic, but any research that we do, just uh, you know, bring that genuine self uh, and, uh, to the to the spot that it, you you are actually uh, in the process and and, um, and the writing in ways that can easier readers can sort of easier relate to. Mm -hmm. so, I mean, I, I, agree. I hope the way we disseminate academic writing evolves. I hope you know, that that fibre will become a... Um, so, so I've got students at the moment who are doing um, performance poetry as their fibre and um, exhibition as their fibre as well. And I hope that academic publishing kind of catches up more with, with that idea too and creates space for silence mm. and um, slowness and activism as well, definitely. Um, and also, I'd, I'd definitely be interested in publishing your work, so it made me laugh that you said I've got no interest in publishing. I've got a, a kind of more extensive book, but I have got, for now, 
I thought because you've, uh, you've been very engaged and attentive and we've already been talking for a long time, so um, I wanted to ask you, Andrew, if you could go back to yourself at the start of the PhD process, what might you say to yourself now? I know you probably would say, you might say slow down or um, make room for silences, but are there, any, are there any other things you would go back to yourself at the start of this journey for whatever better metaphor or the start of this, uh, this, uh, this cycle? Um, what would you go back and say to yourself? That's a tricky question because you just can't, you're not that person anymore and you can't imagine yourself back in that person at this moment. So, and, and actually, um, uh, no, no, maybe, you wouldn't. maybe that's the answer. Maybe you, would, you wouldn't do anything differently. You would yeah, let it just yeah, I don't think. I, yeah, exactly. I don't think I would, because it just this just came out as it was supposed to came at that that moment, and, and that was what was supposed to be. Um, and I think I, I I can't tell myself. I wouldn't tell myself be brave or something because that process of the whole process was coming to that being brave or whatever, having guts to do something this in this way, trusting yourself, trusting the body and so on. So yeah, you can't you know, say, I would say that because that's not the point, because you have to go through that process anyway. Mm -hmm. And you know only that after you've gone through the process. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, so a bit like the seasons, you might just allow yourself to be in a curve. Um, okay, I'll allow that, but what, so what now? What are you going to go on to do now? Yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm how, actually, do you, how are you going to use your thesis and your thinking and the work you've done going forward? Um, or are you going to leave it all behind and do something completely new instead? No, uh, I want to write because like I said earlier, I found this uh, surprisingly sort of, uh, ways of writing that were really, really rewarding. So definitely, I uh, would like to continue work writing, but um, it, again, it has to be somehow come somehow from somewhere organically, not just sort of as, as uh, okay, I need to write something now. Let's, let's do so I'll kind of go with the flow, let's <laughs> say, and see what happens now, and um, um, see what other new encounters happen, what that triggers. But um, I would really like to actually, I, I have these ideas of turning this into some sort of a publication, perhaps a book or something, perhaps four books, um, four seasons, <laughs> four short books, not, <laughs> not a, book, like a, a small series, uh, to take up some themes deeper from there, perhaps leave out some things, obviously, because there was a lot of decisions in the process as well. So many paths open and which things, which paths I'm, I'm going. Uh, exploring deeper, which I'm leaving out, and but that would be one really interesting thing to do. But mm, even more excited, I am about um, thinking about orthography pedagogy <laughs> and working with students in some of those ways. I've been kind of um, organically, in a sense, bringing it into my teaching in the already in the process of writing because I've been writing and teaching at the same time all, all the time. So obviously it was always somehow coming in one form and the time and things. And um, a little glimpses I, I got into what it could do. Very, I'm very, um, uh, it's promising, but they, they really somehow <laughs> activate me and they excite me about the possibilities. Especially also in the context of thinking of the coloniality, the sort of uh, students becoming my teachers. Mm. So and also, also, and this is not to really not to underestimate what you mentioned as well earlier about the connection between ethnography and the well-being, uh, because we see obviously the pandemic has sort of exacerbated some issues, but we see this is such a big problem among, among the population in general, but among young people especially. So I think these are very promising and interesting paths to explore and I'm really excited because it also makes teaching absolutely um, unexpected and, um, and, and moving and, and sort of it may, really the classroom is the place that makes me want to stay in this house. Mm -hmm.
<laughs> if it wasn't for the classroom and encounters with students, I yeah, I probably just would never um, be with them. Uh, you mean you didn't get into education for the meetings and the <laughs> 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 um, I think that's such an important thing to say uh, and I completely agree. I have, what, one of the things I love most about all technology is that it opens up a space where my students teach me. And that's at every level, you know, it, first year undergraduate PhD students, you know, I feel like it is a, a I, I learn new things about new communities and new ideas, new experiences all the time as a result of what technology. Um, and I do think your, your thesis is, is such a compelling insight into, into to the craft of teaching as well and, 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 and why we must learn to lose fight, why we love what we do and why it's worth fighting for um, and defending as well. So, um, yeah, I really thank you for that. Um, and I thank you for, for producing this thesis. It, I do feel transformed as a result of reading your work. And I know that other people will be transformed by it as well. And, and that isn't a small gesture, that is a big gesture to move and transform people with the power of your writing. So um, I don't have any more questions as far as I'm concerned. This part of the, the Bible is over. Um, but I wanted to thank you again, Magda, for the love and the hard work that you've put into the future of the thesis. Thank you. Thank you for coming with that kind of attitude to that work. Right. I'm not sure what we do now. There's a break and then a kind of reconvening. I'll wait to be steered by someone. You're supposed to now give your final statement. Yes. But now, now, yes. Now, yes. Now, yes. Now, 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 yes. I'm always learning. I'm always learning. Yes. Okay. Um, on, um, on page 253, which is a uh, 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 map that says, consenting to room loss is to let yourself be changed by the movement of the process, hoping and trusting the reader will let themselves be changed by the product. I am changed by your work, Magda, and I thank you for it. I can already see how I will allow myself to be influenced by your writings in terms of my own pedagogy, my research, and also myself. I also want to say that if you haven't yet sourced a publisher for this work, do please talk to me outside of this meeting. Um, and then if it's, if it's all right with Magda, I'd like to, to, to read some of your words, Magda, if that's okay, because uh, they stay with me. And because so much of the poetry is, is, is incredibly powerful, and really I wanted to share that with people today. Beginning is invisible, the intimate moment of conception that your body hides even from you. Only later you learn the process has already started, irreversible process that repeats itself in the dawn of the universe. You begin to dwell, pregnant in nothingness. The world might get a glimpse of you, pregnant in nothingness, might even give you advice how to ease the pain of your back how to best use your time, what not to eat, what not to drink, what not to read, how not to write. They will ask you over and over, when is your due date? And you will feel like it will never come. Utopia moment of birth, you don't want it ever to come, fearing you won't handle that new life. But just as your body knew the beginning, it knows when it's time to finish. Hiding from itself again, it will bring this life out, life of me, but not mine. Some story of me, but beyond my control, as it begins to live its own life and write its own story. I am pleased to say that I find this work to achieve the standards of a doctoral thesis, and that the thesis defence permission could be granted after making minor revisions that I would recommend in my report, but I recommend that the observation and findings in this thesis are essentially new, and that the findings are important to the field of autoethnography, to research-based practice, and to higher education pedagogy. Um, I might make recommendations for slight changes in edits that I believe will be completed in the minimum amount of time. Thank you, Dr. Moyan, for your statement. I now cordially invite anybody who has comments regarding my doctoral thesis to offer their comments by asking the for one comment I declare uh, the public defense of the doctoral thesis closed.